Susan, I believe you're on mute. mute. Sorry. Sorry about that. Let me start again. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar on repeal the death tax. My name is Susan Shelley. I am the Vice President of Communications of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, the most influential taxpayer advocacy group in California. And I'm very pleased to introduce HJTA President John Kupal to tell you a little bit about this important initiative. John? Thank you very much, Susan. And usually I'm the one that screws up with technical stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and thank you for joining. I know that we're not, uh, there are some people who will just be joining us shortly. I just got the indication from our technical people that we may not yet be live on Facebook. Nope, there we go. We are now live. So sorry for the little, uh, little hiccup there, but uh, th again, thank you for joining us and uh, for this very important uh, webinar. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with what we're trying to do with trying to reinstate uh, Proposition 58. In other words, uh, repeal the death tax that we have, this new tax, uh, effective as of November of last year because of the passage of Proposition 19. Um, some of you are very familiar with it. Some of you are, may just uh, now be learning about it and have decided to join this webinar to uh, learn a little bit. So. For those of you who know a lot about this and who have some questions about some of the more technical aspects of signing the petitions and, and all the questions associated with a initiative campaign, um, we'll be dealing with that, that in just a moment. But just as a brief uh, background, uh, most of you are familiar with Proposition 13 and how Prop 13 works. Because Proposition 13 limits uh, the annual increases in taxable value of your property. It is true that for people who have lived a long uh, a time in their homes, they have pretty low tax bases. Uh, so when they have children and they want to bequeath the property to their kids or to their grandkids, uh, as a result of the passage of Proposition 19, Californians are no, no longer able to pass along that that lower Prop 13 base, tax year base, to their kids or grandchildren. And as you know, in California, real estate uh, prices are going through the roof. Your parents or grandparents, or maybe you, you, you yourself, uh, have property that has a market value that may be four, five, 10 times greater than the taxable value. So what is the impact when you try to receive that property from your parents or you try to give the property to your kids um, upon your passing. Well, there's a huge increase in, in taxes. It didn't always used to be that way. Uh, you know, Californians overwhelmingly voted back in the early 80s to not have this death tax. In fact, the, the, there was a measure called Prop 58, which was uh, put on the ballot by a unanimous vote of the California legislature, and it passed overwhelmingly. Uh, on the ballot, 74% of California voters supported the notion of getting rid of the of the death tax. So how did Prop 19 sneak by the voters last November? Well, number one, there was a lot of things on the ballot. We were focused very much on fighting another attack on Proposition 13, and there were about 20 other initiatives. Um, and, and of course, the proponents of Proposition 19 didn't talk at all about this massive property tax increase. So um, uh, that's why it snuck through. And even though it's, uh, it did pass, it only passed by a little bit because at, right before the election day, people were beginning to wise up as to what was going on. So uh, that's kind of the background. What we're simply trying to do is to get uh, back to a state of law that existed just a year ago where parents and grandparents could convey their property to their children and grandchildren without triggering a huge reassessment. Now this impacts both homes and it impacts small businesses as well. So with that, let me introduce uh, Susan Shelley is our Vice President of Communications, uh, really the, the tip of the spear on this effort. She's very knowledgeable on, uh, on all the aspects of of this initiative, the Repeal the Death Tax Initiative. And also, uh, Scott Kaufman is uh, 
our legislative director, who is also answering a lot of the questions uh, that you may have on this initiative. And someone who you can't see is just the logo there, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association logo, is uh, Deborah DeRocha, who's here in the Sacramento office, who helps to run uh, the mechanics of the campaign. So where are we with the campaign? Well, I know many of you have been chafing at the bit to get the petitions, and that's the good news. The good news is the petitions are out. Many of you have already received them, but of course we had to file the language. We had to wait for the, the attorney general to give us a title and summary, and then we had to print the petitions. So how many signatures do we need? We need a lot. We need about a million valid signatures, which means we need to go out and get about 1.3 million total signatures and then we will vet those. And so we have a process of, of mailing out those petitions. Many of you have volunteered. And by the way, again, thank you. Thank you so much to all you volunteers. We have had more than, I think, Susan, 1,200 people uh, sign up to be volunteers to help get signatures and to run a credible campaign. Again, thank you all so much for this. We have a very broad coalition of just homeowners, of small business, minority groups, estate lawyers. Estate lawyers were thrown into a tizzy uh, because of the passage of Prop 19 because their clients were shell-shocked by the passage of this of Prop 19, which really messed up their estate planning. So broad coalition, we're moving forward, we're gathering signatures. And with that, I will turn it back over to Susan, who can fill in all the details that I forgot, and then we can open up for questions. Susan? Thank you very much, John. Well, first, let me give you the website where you can get all kinds of information, download flyers, email things to your friends, sign up to get the petitions if you haven't already gotten the petitions. Uh, the website is hjta.org, hjta.org. You'll see a red flashing light at the top. Push that button. It will take you to the Repeal the Death Tax website. And you can also reach it directly, hjta.org slash repeal the death tax. And then when you're there, you can, as I said, get the flyers, sign up, uh, volunteer. We'll send you a banner. We'll send you petitions. We'll send you flyers. We'll get you everything you need to collect signatures. And if you just want to sign it yourself, that's fine, too. We'll send you the petition. Sign it. Sign the declaration of circulator. You're circulating your own petition and send it back to us. It's perfectly valid. So we'll go through the nuts and bolts a little bit of what the campaign involves. Um, it does take 997,000 and change valid signatures of registered voters to get this on the November 2022 ballot. That's where we're aiming, November 2022. When we do this and it qualifies, and it's on the ballot, and it passes, it will be retroactive to February 16th, 2021. One of the most commonly asked questions is, what about all the people in the middle between the date that this took effect and these higher reassessed property values kicked in and the day that this passes? It will be retroactive. So everyone who is reassessed, every property that is reassessed because of a parent-child transfer, between February 16th, 2021, and the date this passes, we'll get the original assessment back. So that's really important to remember, that if something is reassessed in the middle, you will get your original Prop 13 reassessed value back. And you will not have to pay these higher taxes going forward. So that's really important. Another question we've gotten is, how are we going to get our message out, and how difficult is it to do this? And thank you for watching because you're part of that story. How you email your friends and tell people about it. We're going to send you flyers. Let me show you the, the flyers here. This is a basic fact sheet about the, um, about the initiative. This is our death tax calculator, which you can also find on the website, and it will do the math for you. If you put in the current market value of your property, it will figure out for you what the new taxes will be when it's reassessed to market value. And that's what we're going to prevent by doing this. Because as John explained, in 1986, the voters of California said, we don't want that to happen. We don't want property to be reassessed to market value when it's passed from parents to children. It was the same sort of inflationary situation that we're in today, where property is wildly appreciating and people cannot afford to pay 1% of the market value 
every year as a condition of keeping the property. And without that protection, literally, children are receiving a new tax bill along with the sympathy cards in the mail when they lose their parents. And it's just not acceptable. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't think the voters knew that that was in Prop 19 based on our research and just conversations with people. We don't think everybody understood that that was in there. Now, another question we get is about the portability. Prop 19 allowed people to move to a new home and take their old property tax bill with them to any county. And that's really important because that's a, that allows people to move to a new location without being crushed by a new property tax bill based on new market values. So we are not touching that. We are not touching that. That will remain. All we're doing is changing that tax increase portion. We're going to repeal the death tax. So that's what this does. So let's see. I have some other questions to cover here. How we're getting the message out. How difficult is it? It's going to be difficult, but we think we can do it. Um, how does this affect rental properties? Very important distinction here. Under Proposition 19, only a primary residence is going to be eligible for an exclusion from reassessment. And only if the children who inherit it move in and make it their primary residence within one year. You have one year. You have to move in. You have to fill out paperwork, declare that this is your permanent primary residence, and then you are excluded from reassessment, but with a cap. The cap is a million dollars above the current tax bill, the current assessed value. So if you're living in a neighborhood that has wildly appreciated, as many people in California do, the joke is, I always wanted to live in a million dollar house, and now I do. Only you really don't, but you're going to have to pay taxes on it as if you do. And this is, this is just unacceptable. So the, Prop 19 protects the primary residence and a family farm under those conditions, but all other property is reassessed to market value. So a family that owns a duplex, that owns a small business property, a restaurant, that owns a little vacation cabin, reassessed to market value upon the date of transfer. Very severe. Under Prop 58, which passed in 1986 and prevented this, up to a million dollars of assessed value of other property besides the primary residence, in addition to the primary residence, a million dollars of other property was excluded from reassessment. And that protected the small business, the small rental property, uh, whatever people owned that they had put their money into and paid payments on for 30 years so that they could pass it to their children, it was protected and it was not reassessed. Now under Prop 19, all the other property is reassessed. So what does our measure do? When we repeal the death tax, we bring back that exclusion for other property. And we adjust that million dollars for inflation because 1986 dollars and today's dollars are different. So we adjust it for inflation and it will be $2.4 million of other property that can be passed from parents to children without reassessment. A very important protection for people who are climbing the economic ladder and who are trying to provide for the children. If we don't do this, people will be forced to sell their property because they can't pay the taxes. And then someone else will have that asset. Someone else will have the appreciation. And the kids will have the cash, which will be deteriorating under inflation. And so you lose that progress, that generational wealth building. You lose that because of the tax law. That's just wrong. So that's one of the things that makes this so important. Rental properties, investment properties will be protected under our initiative. Go sign the petition. HJTA.org slash repeal the death tax. Click get the petition. We will send it to you. So we had a question about safeguards when you mail back the petitions. If you send it by priority mail or something like that with tracking, you can watch it, make sure it gets delivered. Uh, we're not terribly concerned that things will be stolen from the mail. That is a federal crime, and we're not too concerned that people are watching for these or that they'll even know what's in the envelope because the envelopes are not marked. Uh, so we're not too concerned. But if you're concerned in your neighborhood, if you have a lot of mail theft, then by all means, send it by some sort of tracked mail. Or if you're close to Los Angeles or Sacramento, you can drop it off. 
you can drop it off with us. And we'll have some other locations where you'll be able to drop off petitions where they'll send them back to us also. So we're working on that. That will be on the website when we get it together. Another question we've had is about trusts. Many people come up to our signature table and they tell our volunteers, I don't need to worry about this because my property is in a trust. I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Trusts do not protect you. They do not protect you from property tax reassessment. They just don't. The assessors look through the trust to see who has beneficial ownership of the property. That's always been the case. That's not new. So if you have a trust and there's a parent-child transfer, it's under the exact same rules as if it wasn't under a trust. So if you have spent a lot of time and money working on your estate plan, please call your attorney. Please check to see what your estate plan has done and how it's affected by Proposition 19. And then go to hjta.org, push the red button, push get the petition, and sign this petition to repeal the death tax. We had a question about Senator Pat Bates' proposal to give a two-year delay on the implementation of this. And I'm going to turn it over to Legislative Director Scott Kaufman to update you on what happened with that. Scott? Hi, Susan. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so we, uh, we, we, tried, to, we tried to do this first through the legislature. And we, we, uh, we worked with uh, our state you know, our state representatives, friendly state representatives in, in the legislature to try and get two bills through. One was SB 668. That would have delayed the implementation date uh, of, Pro, of this portion of Prop 19. Um, that, that received a hearing. Well, it received an informational hearing because they didn't want to give it an actual full hearing. And then they decided to do nothing with it. Um, you have to remember that, that the legislature worked with, with the proponents of this initiative to get on the ballot. And so they're not they're not the ones that necessarily want to take it off. They they like this for all intents and purposes. Obviously, not everyone in the legislature could go for allies, but but the, the majority the majority party does. The second bill was ACA nine, uh, w w which was put forward by Assemblyman Kelly Kiley, and that that would have restored uh, the law back to the way it was. Um, we that obviously that didn't that didn't even get a hearing. We didn't even get the decency of a hearing on that one. And so what we did is we just took ACA nine, we tweaked it a little bit, uh, we added. We added a. Uh, uh, we raised the other property from a, from a million to 2.4 million. We just we just went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics inflation calculator, typed in what was a million dollars in 1986, 2.4 came out. We indexed that to inflation. That's the only difference between this what we what we put on the ballot and ACA nine. And we did that because after talking with with you know, small business owners, farmers, and those sorts of things, a million just wasn't enough for them anymore to protect their family farms and their family businesses. And so that was why we, we did that for them. Um, as, as Susan already mentioned, I kind of like to do the what was, what is, and what will be, because I, th I think that's helpful to folks. But uh, Susan talked about it, but I'll, but I'll say it again, just for clarity. The, the, way, the way it was previously is that you inherited your, your, your parents' primary residence, uh, a free and clear, it was not reassessed to market value under any circumstance, and you got up to a million dollars in other property. When Prop 19 passed, it, it changed that, and now you have, to move into the house, claim it within one year. Well, you have to you have to file the homeowner's exemption within one year of the transfer and file a claim for exclusion within three years before, or before transfer of the property. And that one million in other property completely goes away. And then what we're doing is we're, we're putting back the, uh, the, the family home back to the way it was. So you, you inherit the home, you keep the assessed value no matter your circumstance. And, and we raise that one, one million to 2.4 million to index it and index it to inflation, just to keep, to keep up with inflation and, and the rising values of property here in California. I have a, uh, I have a question I can answer here. Somebody said, um, I have friends in another county who would like to sign. Uh, they have friends in two different counties and they, they will all want to sign. You don't have to be in the county in order to collect signatures, uh, but all the signatures on one signature petition have to be in one county. So if you're a resident of Sacramento County and you're taking a trip down to your friends in Monterey, make sure that all the signatures on that one petition are from the county of Monterey. That's the only restriction. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty important. Right. Let me explain how you can see that all the petitions are blank as far as the county is concerned and you as the circulator write in the county 
that you're circulating in. So up here above the signature block, you'll see it says all signers of this petition must be registered to vote in blank county. When you're circulating, if you're in two counties or people from both counties are in your neighborhood, just have two different petitions. Have one for Alameda, have one for another county, have one for Orange County, one for Los Angeles County, and just make sure that all the registered voters on that particular petition are registered voters in that county. And the reason for that, it's easy to remember when you, when you understand the reason, all of these will be returned to the county offices to be validated. And the county offices will validate them against the county's registered voters. So if you have an Orange County voter on an LA, LA petition, that it won't be valid because they, they won't have that person on their rolls in Los Angeles. So just make sure that you have all the registered voters from the same county on the petition that's marked for that county and circulate as many different ones as you want. There's room for six signatures on each petition. If you run out, we'll send you more without a problem. Happy to do it. And something else we get a question on is, can you make corrections or cross outs? You cannot make corrections. That will invalidate it. But you can, if somebody makes a mistake, you can just take a black Sharpie, completely cross it out, and have the person sign again. That you can do. But do not overwrite anything the voter did. All of the information in the block has to be written in the voter's own hand. You can't fill in the addresses and have them sign it. They have to fill it out. They have to sign it. And as I said, if there's a mistake, just completely cross it out, start again, and you'll be good to go. I, guess I, I want to jump in real quick, Susan, and just uh, reiterate how important it is to make sure that all signers of the petition are registered in the same county. We received a petition just today from, from someone who, who wrote Santa Barbara slash San Luis Obispo County in that line. Every signature on that initi on that petition are invalid, um, so we're, we're going to have to send it back and have them redo it, but that, that's an important thing. One county per petition above the signature spaces, you'll see a space to write in the name of the county. Everyone who signs a petition must reside in that county. Only registered voters may sign. You, you, can, you can have folks register to vote online. It's very easy. Register to vote.ca.gov if they're not. Voters must fill out their information themselves and must use their residential address, the address that they're registered to vote at, where they get their ballot. That's the address that they must sign with. Street addresses only, no PO boxes or work addresses. And for the, and for the petition circulator, don't forget to fill out the declaration of circulator section. After collecting signatures, fill out and sign the circulator section in your own handwriting. You can be from any county. You, can, you don't even have to be from the state. A lot of paid signature gatherers aren't even from our state. But the people who are signing it must be from the county that this petition is set for. But you can be from anywhere. Um, so there, there was a question about, as John mentioned, um, can I collect signatures in Monterey and Alameda County? Yes, you can collect signatures anywhere, but the people signing the petition must either be from Monterey or Alameda County on that petition. One petition for Monterey County, one petition for Alameda County, and, that, and that's how that works. So we will send you these instructions, quick instructions with uh, big bullet points, more detailed instructions with the, the law spelled out and an example of what the signature blocks have to look like. It's really easy. All you have to do is make sure that they are registered voters and that they're signing a petition for the county in which they live. That's really it. It's pretty easy. Uh, who is organizing our volunteers is one of the questions. Well, we're all doing it. We're all organizing volunteers. Everybody who signs up on our Get the Petition link is in our spreadsheet, which goes to us only. And we're going to try and connect volunteers who want to get together with other people in their area to do tables and that kind of thing. Another question we get is, where can we collect signatures? So you have, you have the, um, the right to collect signatures in various places. We recommend that you ask a store manager or a store owner or a mall owner for permission to set up a table. We'll send you a banner. It'll say, paid for by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Everyone will know it's legitimate. Um, and you can, you can set up and collect signatures wherever it's permitted. And we are gonna, we're going to look into, some people have suggested to us that there have been court decisions that say people can be there even if the store doesn't approve. We're not so sure that's necessary. Um, so we think we can just politely ask, get permission, be cooperative, and we'll do fine with that. Um, there may course, be public areas. I'm yeah, sorry, go ahead. And, yeah, and of course, 
any public forum, you can set, set it up on a sidewalk as long as you're not uh, blocking a sidewalk. But if there's a public thoroughfare or even if there's a, a shopping mall where the, that, that's got an entrance off a of main street, you can always set up something on the, the public access, uh, uh, access with a banner that says sign here as people are driving in. So you're not impeding the store's activities because you're on a, on a public place. And the other thing is you can also go, if you have uh, neighbors, you can always do door to door. We are, we are finding that uh, a good way to get uh, signatures now from a lot of people is going uh, door to door. Uh, I have one more technical question that somebody has sent in. The $2.4 million exclusion for non-residential property, is that indexed under our initiative? The answer is yes. So it will be $2.4 million when this initiative passes. And going forward, it's, it's pegged to inflation. So it will be indexed. We're not going to make the same mistake that they made back in 1986 with Prop 58 when they did not index it. We have indexed it. Susan? Absolutely. Okay, we had a question on whether we're going to use paid signature gatherers. At this time, this is an all-volunteer effort, and it's going very well. If we can raise enough money to, to have paid signature gatherers and, and push this across the finish line, we'll certainly be willing to do that. If you would like to support this campaign financially, go to hjta.org slash repeal the death tax. Click the donate link and help us with this effort because we're counting on every Californian who's affected by this to see how important it is and how much money this will save your family. Go to the death tax calculator. Show your kids, show your parents, show your relatives how much this is going to cost if the property is reassessed to market value because it's a nasty surprise when you get that letter. We have a question. Uh, another question we have. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say John. we had a question about how are the signatures being organized. If, if by that you mean how we're organizing them when they are returned to us, we're organizing them by county because, as Susan indicated, we turn them into the individual registrar, county registrars of voters. And then the same person asked a question of whether or not we're uh, contacting the Apartment Owners Association. Yes, there are several Apartment Owners Association. I've already spoken to one, the Apartment Owners of America, and there's another one, Apartment Association of Greater Los Angeles. We, have, we are actively reaching out to the apartment associations uh, who are extremely supportive of this because many of the mom and pop owners of small apartment units, you know, a duplex, a quadplex, small apartment building, they are very much impacted by this. Prop 19 took away the entirety of their ability to pass along that property to their children. And it has a huge impact on tenants because what's going to happen? What's going to happen when somebody receives property from their parents, and yet their property tax bill knows, now goes up by a factor of six. What's going to happen to the tenants? The tenants are going to start paying higher rents, and I think the tenant community is going to start realizing this as well. So again, uh, what's good for the apartment building owner is also good for the tenants. Susan, Absolutely. back to you. Absolutely. So we had a question of how did this, this death tax get on the ballot in the first place? How did this get into Prop 19? And therein lies a tale. So here's what happened. A couple of years ago, the California Association of Realtors wanted to have portability expanded. You might remember that under Prop 60 and Prop 90, a person who was over 55 and owned a home could move to another home in the same county or in another county that accepted the transfers and take the old property tax bill with them. You could only do it once in your lifetime, and the new house had to be the same value or less than the house you were selling in order for that to be valid. Prop 19 and, and its predecessor, which I think was Prop 5, I can't remember the number, uh, the effort was to take those, those restrictions off so that people could move to any county in California any house value and do it more than once. And if you move to a house that was a greater value, there would be an adjusted blended assessment. So that did not succeed a couple of years ago. And the California Association of Realtors came back. They had some conversations with the legislature. And I will turn it over to Scott to explain how the rest of that played out. 
Well, uh, <laughs> this has kind of had a, a, a tortured path to the ballot, to say, to say the least. It, uh, it was not finished in, in time by the deadline, so they just extended the deadline of the legislature. Um, but, uh, but yes, it was, it was a, uh, an initiative that, that, the, that the, the realtors were gathering signatures for. The way it works in California is if you get 25% of signatures, it moves to the legislature for an informational hearing, and the legislature can, can work with you to get it on the ballot. The legislature did. Um, they they uh, they helped in, add this part, the international transfer. I think this this was I, I would say this was probably more the legislature's doing than the realtors doing. The realtors really wanted the affordability part, but you know to to get it to get it on the ballot, they had to make a deal, and uh, it, it's not it's not a good deal uh, by by uh, as far as we're concerned. But that's that's unfortunately the way politics works, and especially here in California. Um, and that became ACA 11, Assembly Constitutional Amendment 11, and ACA 11 became Prop 19, and that that's what reached the ballot, and that and that's what we're looking to uh, to take to 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 repeal at least this portion, the international transfer portion, restore it back to the way it was. I guess I would mention, Susan, since I have a moment here, um, another question that we're that we're getting about the petitions is that at the top of the signature line, um, can't can't get it here because I've got the blurred background, but at the top of the signature line. It says official top funders valid only for November 2021. Yeah, Susan's going to hold it up for you if you can see it. But uh, for, for, for 2021, and people are asking, well, I just got the signatures and it's December. Is, is, is mine no longer valid? No, you are fine. That is a campaign finance thing. That is a thing for us and, and the, the campaign finance folks. Every time we print materials, we're supposed to, especially something on this, every time we print petitions, we're supposed to list the top funders. And so in November 2021, we were the top funder. We were the only top funder, and we're still the only top funder, so it's not going to change between petitions. But every time we print new petitions, we have to update the uh, who, who's paying for the petitions, which is us, and it will probably continue to be us. But uh, but yeah, so that doesn't apply to you. That's purely us. John, I see you putting your hand up. Did you want, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, adding on to the, the signature issue, somebody asked about the, the the paid signatures, you know, there's been no initiative uh, that's qualified in California using entirely volunteers since 1978, and that was Prop 13. That was our initiative. Prop 13 was qualified using 100% volunteers, and we are shooting to have this qualify using nothing but volunteers. Uh, two reasons. Number one, I think when volunteers do it, they're engaged. They know about it. It's better than using uh, uh, paid uh, signature gatherers. Some of them can be very good, but we'd rather engage you and the thousands of other people for whom this is a very, very important issue. Um, also, it's costly, and if we once we qualify, we're going to need our revenue to uh, to actually run the campaign, and that means radio ads, uh, direct mail, uh, TV ads. If we can afford it, TV is very expensive in California, but certainly. Once we qualify, we're going to need resources to actually run the campaign to get this thing passed. Now, the question we sometimes get is, well, people just passed 19, which took away this right. What makes you think that you're going to be successful in reinstating Prop 58? What makes you think that people want to repeal the death tax? Well, number one, we did extensive polling on this by a credible polling firm. And the polling on this issue of repealing the death tax is off the charts on the what they call the umbrella issue of, do you want to reinstate the ability of parents and grandparents to convey their property to their kids without triggering a reassessment scores at 74%. That's very, very high. This initiative, if we qualify it, we're not gonna say it's gonna pass itself, but it's not gonna be as difficult or as complicated as many of the other initiatives that we've been involved in. So we're confident that if we can qualify this initiative, that it will pass. And that means we need to get the signatures, get those signatures back to our offices. We will soon be uh, sending out, uh, I'm sure Susan and, and, and Scott will be sending out locations where we can turn in uh, uh, petitions. For example, we've had a number of uh, a state lawyer firms indicate that they would be willing to be collection places and also some of the apartment associations, one of the major associations has six different locations throughout California. 
at some point we will let you know what those locations are for now we want the mail back or if you can hand deliver them or arrange with susan or scott in a way to get them back to us there will be multiple ways to get those signatures back to us right so, and please i'm sorry go ahead go ahead well, I, was, I think i was going to say the same thing you were going to say susan but uh just just to stress that it's important to just send them back to us as soon as you've completed the six signatures uh we'd rather have them now rather than later obviously we're going we're going to collect them we're going to file we're going to collate them we're going to do signature verification verification that takes time so the sooner you can get them back to us the better we we don't want to get 1.3 million signatures mailed back to us uh, April 1st, and then we've got a little under a month to make sure that we have the signatures necessary to qualify. <laughs> so send them back as soon as you get six, six signatures. If you need more petitions, we will send you more. Um, and I would say to John, I, and I would mention, you know, John mentioned that we that we think this is very that this is very viable. And I would just add the fact that uh, the proponents of Prop 19 spent 50 million dollars to pass this measure by two points, a point, really, uh, a, a little a little over a point. Um, so, so the fact, and this was all with all the other stuff in it. So, I, I, I think I think we have a very good chance here uh, of, of doing this because I, when when you explain when you take this part out and you explain it to people clearly and you ask them the question directly, our polling shows that folks are opposed, and and this is and this is different than 19. 19 had the other the other you know the other good stuff, and I think I think John in the column called it a big juicy steak laced with cyanide, right? We're pulling the cyanide out and saying, "Do you want the cyanide?" And uh, and uh, and folks are telling us, "No, they don't." And so <laughs> it, 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 it took fifty million fifty million dollars to, to get this passed with a, by one point with the juicy steak. We don't. We think we think we can get this undone very easily. Yes. Yes, and I would just like to go back to ACA eleven, which was the legislature's rewrite of the. California Association of Realtors initiative. The legislature rewrote this and added a few little things to make it poll better and look a little better on the ballot title. And they did it in about six days. They didn't have hearings. They rammed it through. They were actually, as Scott said, past the deadline. And one of the groups of people in California who were most upset about this were the assessors who have to implement this, who have to send out the letters to the grieving families. They're the ones who are most intensely questioning all of these aspects of implementing the Prop 19 death tax. So John, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the assessors think, the ones that you've spoken to about this? Well, many of the assessors have already signed on board with, with this effort because uh, Prop 19, the way it was drafted, uh, left so many ambiguities about, and left a lot of responsibilities with the assessors because the question they have is, okay, uh, as a county assessor, am I gonna have to track down people to see where they really live? Uh, this is not a job that the assessors wanted and they were pretty irate against, uh, against Proposition 19. The, the good news is we've had, uh, I don't think we've had any assessor uh, uh, indicate to us that they would oppose our effort. And I think out of the 58 assessors, we've had at least 20 indicate support. So, and some of them said they're going to be <laughs> getting signatures for us. So when your county assessor, who is the person responsible for tracking laws related to property taxation, when they look at what uh, their responsibilities are and, and the fact that now they have to contact grieving families to let them know that, oops, you're now getting a huge tax bill, um, that uh, uh, that's not good. Uh, you know, I had one county assessor tell me, he says, we, he lives in a more rural county. He said, if you guys don't reverse this, I've got a lot of people in my county where, who are not very wealthy, who when they receive the family home or the family farm, if they get hit with a full reassessment, they're going to have to sell and then they're going to move out of the county. And so you, you shouldn't be shouldn't be forcing people out of their family homes or their family businesses or their family farms through a law that imposes a huge tax increase when their parents pass away. It's just not right. Absolutely. So for anybody who joined late, here's how you get the petition. Go to hjta.org. That's the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, hjta.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a red flashing light that says repeal the death tax. Find out how. Click that red button. It will take you to the website. 
and then you'll see a get the petition button and when you click that it takes you to our Google form which creates our database for sending you the petition we'll send you the petition the instructions some pens some imprinted pens that you can hand out to people to help promote this some flyers for the same purpose we're getting some door hangers printed we'll be sending those out to volunteers who want to walk their neighborhood you you don't have to you don't have to do anything you can just get one petition and sign it we'll probably send you a couple of extras just to give away to your friends uh, but you can do one petition and sign it or you can set up a table request a banner we'll send you a banner set up a card table have a stack of petitions have a stack of flyers we'll get your door hangers we're going to get you some printed cards they have bullet points on them um, one thing about registering voters that i want to mention everyone who signs must be a registered voter but they don't have to have been a registered voter for very long they can register to vote right there at your table on their phone you can go to register to vote.ca.gov that takes you to the secretary of state's website register to vote.ca.gov and they can register to vote online on their phone regardless of what county they live in and then they can sign the petition and there's also a, a site to check the voter registration if people aren't sure if they've moved and they aren't sure whether it has changed or not you can go to the secretary of state's website and you can verify their registration so that they're sure they're signing with the correct residential address it's really very easy it's all online it's very secure and it allows us to engage voters because eventually when this is on the ballot we want people to know about it to vote for it to turn out to vote for it not to put it aside and say this doesn't matter to me this matters to everyone as John said earlier if you're a tenant and you live in a building that's going to be inherited it could be demolished when the new owners take over everybody could be evicted because once that new property tax bill comes for the market value of that older apartment building there's a very good chance that the heirs will not be able to make that pencil out any longer and there's only so much red ink that people can absorb before they have to sell so tenants could be evicted rents could be raised homes could be sold small businesses that have suffered during the pandemic could be sold when inherited because this new tax bill will be the last nail in the box and we're going to stop that from happening I have a question so a question came in uh, it says I heard that the Attorney General is looking at 46 more initiatives do you think the intent is to bury this repeal the death tax initiative under all the rest I don't think that's the intent I think initiatives it's easy to file an initiative it's very difficult to qualify it. So I do not anticipate we'll see 46 uh, uh, ballot measures in November of 2022. I do think given some of the players who are out there right now, some very uh, uh, wealthy interests that we could see as many as 20, but I don't think there's an underlying intent to bury this initiative. I think the merits of this initiative that, that, that are repeal the death tax measure will rise or fall on its own merits. And I think it's important for us to get, get the word out on this one. And speaking of getting the word out, a question that we get very often is, are there going to be yard signs? And the answer is, when we get a proposition number, we will print yard signs and we will get them out to everybody who wants to distribute them or put them out on the lawn and display them. So yes, but not yet. Um, did we have another question I was going yeah, to answer? Oh, we Susan, I can jump in here. There's one. There's okay. one that I saw a while ago. Uh, someone asked if I'm if I'm already collecting signatures for another uh, initiative, can I also collect signatures for this initiative? And the answer is yes. You can collect signatures for as many initiatives as you like. Obviously, we're not going to ask you to collect any signatures, but our signatures. But if you're working with another group, you're welcome to collect their signatures. You're welcome to collect signatures for us. You can you can work with any other group that you want to work with to you know, staff a table together, anything like that. We're not gonna place any rules or requirements on you. Um, we're just happy that you're helping us get this on the ballot. So whichever way works for you, so long as you're following the, the rules that the, the Secretary of State's office requires. Um, and you know, and obviously, as Susan mentioned, we're, we're gonna send you that, that fact sheet um, when you get a packet of petitions, kind of explaining how the petitions must be signed. Other than that, you're, you're, you're good to do it however you'd like to do it. 
And we have a resource for volunteers on our website. If you go to hjta.org slash repeal the death tax, you will see a volunteer center link. And on that, we have a frequently asked questions for volunteers for signature gathering. And we'll keep updating that as we find more things that aren't clear. And uh, flyers, you can download the instructions. Uh, what, really, whatever you need is going to be there. Uh, if you need a banner, you, want, you can call us. You can write to us. My email is susan at hjta.org, susan at hjta.org. Or you can call our offices. Sacramento office is 916-444-9950. Once again, 916-444-9950. And the LA office is 213-384-9656. So you can always make arrangements to pick up things in person if you're near those offices, or we will mail it to you, or we will be setting up places where you can pick things up in person in every county in the state. We're going to find locations in every county where people can pick up petitions, pick up flyers, drop them off, and generally get whatever they need as fast as we can get it to them. Roughly 100,000 signatures a week is what we need in January, February, and March. 100,000 signatures a week. So if you know people who would like to volunteer for this, who would like to sign, who would like to have this mailed to them, please let them know and send them to the website. Email all your friends. Call all your relatives. Alert the neighbors. Wake everybody up. This is really important. This is a really important grassroots political effort in California. People very often ask us, how are we going to make it better in California? And this is the answer. We all work together. There's a question Anymore? here. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, okay, uh, there was, a, the, the, there was a, uh, a question. Who was going to be opposing us? Uh, the normal, what I what I usually refer to as the usual suspects, uh, those interest groups that want more tax revenue. Uh, you know, l let's talk about the fundamental underlying issue here. California is already a high tax state. We have the highest income tax rate in America. We have the highest state sales tax rate in America. We have the highest gas tax in America. We have the highest corporate tax west of the Mississippi. And even with Proposition 13, we are in the top third of all states in per capita property tax collections. And right now, the state is setting up, sitting on tens of billions of dollars of surplus revenue. So let's not worry about whether or not government, either, either local government or state government, is going to be starved by the passage of this initiative. It's going to save families, but it's not going to hurt the bottom line of government entities. The interests that are, uh, are aligned against us are those who either are on the public payroll or who have a connection to uh, government interests and see this as a potential threat uh, to them. But if you're a taxpayer, this is a no-brainer. Back to you, Susan. Well, I guess okay, we I, have a I, would, I would jump in, John, and also say that uh, you know the, the question about you know, there's 46 potential initiatives, you know, should we be concerned? I, I would also say that, that those, you know, any, anytime you've got a lot of, a lot of initiatives on the ballot, there's, there's always the issue of kind of voter fatigue. And as, as you get to the bottom of the ballot, people start voting no. And that's a concern for all of us. But I also think it's a concern for, uh, for folks on the other side as well, because, you know, we're looking at a potential for, for, for a school choice initiative where we're looking at a potential initiative to limit collective bargaining rights for public employee unions. Um, we're looking, there's a, there's a bunch of potential ballot, there, there's a, there's another, there's a taxpayer protection act that, that, that that's being worked on. There's a lot of other measures that are going to divide the opposition's attention as well. And, you know, and, and frankly, while a hundred million dollars, you know, is a lot of money for, for you and me, the average person that they're taxing us, as far as the budget's concerned, they have bigger fish to fry. And I think that their focus are going to be on those fish. It's a lot of money for us. It's not a lot of money for them. And, uh, you know, and that doesn't make that doesn't make it a difference as far as we're concerned. I mean, we're signally focused on this because any dollar that 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 we think is wrongly taken away from you should be returned. So we're signally focused on this, but I think that they have they're gonna have a lot of fish to fry on the November 2022 ballot. Yes. Okay, a couple of technical questions about the about the petition. Do not write in this column here that says for official use only. That will mess up the validation. So just make sure that everybody stays to that margin and doesn't write in the official use one inch column, which is spelled out in the state's code. It's in the law, one inch exactly, one inch at the top margin. It's all very precise. Something else, do not make a copy of it. 
do not make a copy of just the signature page and add that, that will not be valid. Every voter who signs must be given the official real petition with the full text of the measure in it in case they want to read it. Do not Xerox it, photocopy it, scan it and print it. Do not. The real petition, just call us and we'll send you more of them. And the question on zip code. Zip codes are not required. They're not required, but if you write it in, it does not invalidate the signature. The purpose is to identify the voter to make sure that the person who signed is a registered voter and to match that. So the address has to match, but the zip code is not required. It's OK if it's there, not required. And I just, I got a question that I can answer. It's about um, a bill that was working its way through the legislature last year, SB 660, that would have uh, dealt with um, how paid signature gatherers are paid. Um, they were going to be paid, currently they're paid by the signature. This bill would require them to be paid hourly. Um, obviously, we oppose that with, along with a lot of other kind of good government groups who worry that that would make it so only only the, the, the entrenched special wealthy interests would be able to qualify an issue for the ballot. Um, the governor vetoed it. He's actually vetoed that bill a couple of times. We've come to him, I think, at least twice now, and he's vetoed it both times for the same reason that they're worried about the impact it would have on the signature gathering process and for grassroots organizations like ours to collect enough signatures to qualify something for the ballot. So I'm not worried about that. It could come back next year. and e But even if it did come back next year and it was passed, it would not affect this election. It would probably it would probably go into effect January of uh, 2023 would be my guess. So it would have no bearing on our initiative process or if we decide to pull the trigger on paid signature gathers have any effect on that as well. Okay. Are there any more questions or anything else that we can think of that we forgot to mention? I'm sure I'll there'll just, be things. I'll, I'll, I'm sure there'll be things that we'll remember as soon as this call is over. This well, I I just remember to invite everybody to become a member of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. We will work for you whether you're a member or not. We will work for the people of California regardless. But when you join, you strengthen the voice of taxpayers in California, and we certainly need more of that. So go to hjta.org and click become a member and it's only fifteen dollars a year and you strengthen the voice of taxpayers and you help this effort and to donate to this effort go to the repeal the death tax website click that red button at the top of the website and click the donate button on the repeal the death tax website and donate to this particular campaign and under california law the association's money can't be used for the campaign so we have to have a separate campaign committee political donations are different. And then we can use that money for radio commercials, yard signs, flyers, petition printing, everything that we need to do for the campaign. We can't use the association donations for that, but we can use the campaign committee donations for that. So just a little note there on the complexity of politics in California. We did get a late, a, a last minute question and, I, and I'm gonna defer to the experts here. Uh, the city need to be spelled out, it does, right? It can be abbreviated, but it's better if it's spelled out. It, it just mostly has to be clear. It has to match. Uh, this, the purpose is for the, the clerks in the counties to be able to identify the voters, finding their address clearly. If you write LA instead of Los Angeles, it is still valid, but writing it out is always better. Any further questions? Any further comments? Well, I, I think let us know if you'd like to have um, us do uh, these webinars on a periodic basis. Uh, if you find this helpful, let us know, uh, because if, if it is helpful, we'll uh, do some more. We're doing some targeted presentations to individual groups. For example, I was able to speak before the County Assessors Association on what we're doing, and I'm also speaking before a number of apartment associations. And it, even though it was the realtors who sponsored Prop 19, a lot of the local realtor groups were actually on our side. So we're doing some speaking to the realtor associations. So there's a lot of groups out there. If you've got a large group and would like a presentation, either Zoom or potentially in person, uh, let us know. And we, we're more than welcome to, to find alternative ways to get the, get the word out. 
Absolutely, and we do we do calls every two weeks for our volunteers Zoom Zoom calls where we're happy to answer your questions and any concerns that come up and inform people about how to do this. So just sign up as a volunteer, get the petition, and you'll get the email on when we're doing our Zoom calls. We had a question on what's the the deadline, the dead dead deadline for turning them in. I believe it is April 29th. So if you're collecting signatures for us, send them back as soon as you have them because we need to know where we are in the process. But the dead, dead deadline for sending them back to us is mid-April. So call it April 15th for sending it back to us because we must turn it in by April 29th or anything we don't turn in at that point is not valid. I guess I would just maybe like to close with, uh, I've seen a couple of comments where people are, are thanking us for what we're doing. And, and while we appreciate that, you know, at the end of the day, it, it's really, we should be thanking you um, you know, we are a small but mighty organization and our power is really people power and, you know, being able to to work with you all to get this done. We appreciate all the help you're giving us and getting because it's, it's just wrong what they're doing to people. And, and we're so and we're so happy to kind of be the catalyst for this. But really, it's thanks to all of you who are out there collecting signatures for us. So we Absolutely. really appreciate you and thank you for your help. Yeah. Thank so you. So once, once again, go to HJTA.org. Push the red button at the top to go to repeal the death tax. Call us if you need us. We're here for you. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Susan Shelley, Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. For HJTA President John Kupal and Legislative Director Scott Kaufman and the great Deborah DeRosiers, who is in the office in Sacramento. And for the rest of the HJTA team, thank you for being with us. And call us if you need us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.